I'm here with Professor Jeffrey Wolf, Harvard and Yale trained historian and historian of Jewish law. Thank you for being with us today, My Professor pleasure. Wolf. Professor Wolf, in light of the Islamic temple denial, which has become so prominent in the past few years, and in light of the fact that some rabbis hold that there's no halakhic basis for Jewish presence on the Temple Mount, uh, could you give us a 2,000 year uh, synopsis of the actual connection between the Jewish people and the Temple Mount since the destruction of the Holy Temple? Uh, it was pleasure. I, I, the 20 minute, a 20 minute review of 2,000 years is better than a two minute uh, Facebook review that's uh, been running through the internet, so I guess we'll be okay. Um, I, uh, I think we have to distinguish a number of different, uh, a number of different issues here, and, uh, and I'd like to take them one at a time. And number one, on the question of uh, Muslim temple denial, Muslim temple denial is a relatively new a phenomenon. It's less than 100 years old. The Muslims have always admitted, and, and, and early Muslim sources ex state explicitly that the temple was built on the Temple Mount. In fact, the Arabic name for uh, Jerusalem, Al-Quds, is in fact a uh, corruption of the, uh, of the words Bayt al-Maktus, the place of the, uh, of the Holy Temple. So, so this is a uh, is a relatively new uh, is a relatively new phenomenon. On the one hand, on the other hand, it is uh, essential to Islam because, at least according to the way that Muslim theology is presented today and taught today, basically Judaism and Christianity either have lost any of their validity or never were valid in the in the first place. With the result that Islam claims every single sacred place in the world as a Muslim place, so that uh, it's the ultimate in what uh, the theologians call supersessionism, meaning that as far as they're concerned, there is no room for anything else but Islam, and uh, that's the reason why they have, um, they have, they have worked so hard to uh, claim that every Jewish makom kadosh, every Jewish sacred place is Muslim, to ban uh, non-Muslim prayer in those places. It's not just Harabai, it's not just the Temple Mount, it's also the, uh, it's also Marat it's, uh, in fact, recently, until, rec until recently, this was a total, uh, it was totally unheard of, but now they're claiming that Keva Rachel, the grave of Rachel, is also a Muslim holy place. They found some, some, uh, some legend that, uh, in fact, it's the grave of some Muslim saint, and now they claim Jews can't pray there either. Uh, so that, uh, that, that denial, on the one hand, is new, on the, one hand, on the other hand, is essential uh, <clears throat> in that regard. Um, with regard to Jewish presence, I think it's important to go back to the very, very beginning. The truth of the matter is that the Temple Mount has always been, from the time of uh, that, that David HaMelech brought the uh, Ark to the Temple Mount, has been the focal point and the, point and the drawing point for Jewish spirituality. Now, even after the destruction, and this is the piece I want to, I want to, I want to emphasize, people were still drawn to Harabayat. Now, it's true. The Romans, and followed by the Byzantines, the Byzantines are, are basically Romans, but after, they, uh, after the empire became Christian, it's uh, termed Byzantine historically, um, Jews were barred from the Temple Mount, either as an act of humiliation by the Romans to, under, 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 to underscore the fact that the Temple had been destroyed and the Jews had lost their, uh, had lost their center. But, um, um, but even under, and, and under Christians, because Christianity also teaches that uh, Christianity had taken the place of Judaism and Judaism had lost its standing, uh, Jews were frequently barred, but as often as they could get there, they went. So under Roman rule, uh, not infrequently, they were allowed to go on Harabayat on Tisha B'Av to bewail the destruction of the temple um, under Christianity. Um, sometimes they were allowed there, but even when they couldn't, uh, there are tr tremendously moving descriptions about how uh, Jews would gather on, on, the, on the Mount of Olives, on Hoshana Rabbah, and they would recreate the seven circuits with Lulav and Esrig on, Har on, 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 uh, on the Mount of Olives, so that at least they could see Harabayat while they were there. That was the, the kind of pull that the, uh, that the Mount had on them. In addition, and this is something people don't re really acknowledge enough because there's too much specialization in terms of, in terms of education, in terms of academics, um, if you look at the 
wall paintings of every single ancient synagogue built from the time before the destruction of the temple until the Middle Ages. You find that all of them are decorated with temple imagery. The Ark especially is portrayed as the, with, as the Ark uh, as sort of flying in the middle of the Mikdash, of the temple complex itself, surrounded by temple uh, by temple uh, appurtenances and um, accessories, it, with the, and the senses. In fact, a friend of mine who's a uh, art, distinguished art historian told me the idea is you walk into Shul and you're not in Shul. You're not just in the synagogue. You're in the temple. So you're enveloped in a temple experience. And it's interesting that this is not just true of, syn of synagogues that were built in the Middle East. They were built. It's true of synagogues that were built outside of Eretz Israel. Uh, I'll give you two examples geographically distinct. One is Dura Europis, which is on the uh, Syrian, bo Syrian border with Iraq today, and the other one is in, um, is in, uh, is in Italy, where you have the exact same uh, type of setup. You d and people decorate um, shoals with what is meaningful to them. Right. And the idea being that obviously, that as far as they were concerned, psychologically, the synagogue, when they say the synagogue is a mikdash me'at, is a lesser sanctuary, it doesn't mean it's a substitute mm -hmm. for the temple. It is a, to use internet language, it's a portal to the temple. So in terms of awareness, we have to realize that that's a very, very profound and important part of Jewish, um, of Jewish, uh, of Jewish spirituality. I'll even add uh, personal, uh, uh, not a personal, well, maybe personal plug. I, I've written a lot on the idea that, uh, especially in Ashkenaz in France and Germany, up till, you know what, up until modern times, the synagogue was defined as literally the embodiment of the temple to the extent that people were bowing, doing all kinds of things in the, in the synagogue because the temple is what draws you. And it didn't mean you, you want to decentralize. It meant that we have to hold on to our relationship to the Beit HaMikdash. So the idea that the Beit HaMikdash is something which is outside of Jewish consciousness is just not true. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely not true. Um, so that's number one. Number two, when possible, whenever possible, Jews would go to Har Habayat. Um, we know, for example, the, the, the sources are not 100%, uh, uh, they're not, certainly not, there aren't a lot of them, but there is indication, are indications that there was a shul, uh, there was a synagogue on Har Habayat until the 13th century, approximately. Um, we know about, this is the famous, uh, that's what you guys uh, like to, I'd like to make, make people aware properly so, that Maimonides went to Harabayat and a student of Nachmanides named, uh, named Astoria Parchi, Farchi went up to Harabayat and, and, and others. Whenever they could, they did. And the only thing that stopped uh, frequent um, going up to Harabayat was in fact the arrival of Muslim uh, dynasties who began to enforce much more ferociously this idea that kafiri, that infidels don't belong in Muslim holy places, according to them, and they stopped Jews from being able to pray there. But for the first, uh, at least the first, I'm, I'm, I'm mathematically challenged, 600 years of Islam, uh, that wasn't the case. It certainly was not the case. Uh, and indeed, there was no, uh, and, and people not going to Harabai was, was not a halachic issue. On the contrary, as is well known, there is a significant difference of opinion between Maimonides and Rabbi Abraham ben David of Poskir, the Ravid, as to whether there is any, whether there any, any, any need for purification before you go onto, onto the Temple Mount, even to the point, even to the part, even to the area of the, of the, of the Temple itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, never mind the extensions, which likely weren't ever sanctified uh, in the first place, where anybody can uh, could ostensibly go. So, in terms of that, um, there's no, uh, there is certainly every historical reason to uh, to for now that we have a very clear idea. Uh, let's do this uh, carefully. Uh, since we have a very clear idea of what isn't the area of the temple where you would need to be purified of of tumat meit of of death pure, death impurity. Um, there's no reason. There's no reason not to. The the I, I really don't understand the idea of those who bat, who who uh, said the, the Jews are not allowed to go. I really don't understand it, especially because the result was that the only people who didn't go on Harabayat as a result uh, under the mandate or or even after sixty seven were people who specifically would go up with the proper preparation because tourists have been going up 
ever since. And here, the only ones that aren't going are the ones who, who actually would go to mikveh and would prepare themselves properly and would go for the, for the purpose, not just not to look at Harabayat as a, as a, as a tourist uh, site, but to, have, to be there as to, be, to fulfill the mitzvah of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, Riyat Pnei Hashem uh, Bim Komo. Excuse me, Professor. At what point, if it was agreed by the rabbis through many centuries that uh, it was perfectly acceptable and proper to go up to the Temple Mount, at what point did rabbis start saying it's forbidden? Um, it's hard to know. Um, we know that under the um, that under that once the that in the 19th and 20th century, you begin to get this kind of uh, reticence. Uh, I, it's 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 difficult to understand. Uh, is there any? Reasoning that can be understood as, as behind yeah, that? Yeah, there's fear. Look, it, there, it, going on Harabayat is, so I'll tell you a story. I, I, uh, there is a, there is a co interesting comment in, uh, by the Tosafists. In the 12th century, in the, sorry, in the 12th century, uh, Rabbi Jacob Tam, the famous Balatosafist, Rashi's grandson, had a student whose name was Rabbi Chaim Cohen. And Chaim Cohen said that you're not allowed to go to, to make Aliyah. This is the context, the context of, of moving to Israel because there's so many mitzvahs and it's so difficult and you'll, you'll make mistakes and you do a, you'll, you'll do Averot and, 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 and you bet, better not. There is a sort of like better not attitude of why start? And, uh, you know, we'll wait, we'll wait for the Messiah, we'll wait for this, we'll wait for that. Interestingly, he was a minority or at least he was, uh, he was not, uh, did not, does not, not represent the, 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 the regnant thinking among the Tosafists because one of it, much of his contemporaries, 300 of them by, according to, according to legend, uh, made Aliyah 1211, uh, despite the fact that he says, oh, you shouldn't go, and so on and so forth. But there is this sense of reticence, I, and I understand it, that people go of saying, you know, the, you know, if you make a mistake, the ramifications are really serious. If you go in the wrong place, you will be high of karate. Uh, whatever karate means, whether it means you're going to draw, you'll die early, you won't have children, whatever it is, it's not it, good, it's not. Right. So the idea is that there is, a, 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 so number one, there is the severity of the issue. Number two, um, there is this, um, there is this idea that, um, that if there's something that you don't know, or to which you're not, from, with which you're not familiar, and it is something which has inherent sanctity to it, it is not only attractive, it is scary. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what comes to expression in Chaim Cohen's statement. Eretz Yisrael at that point was not a living, it, it was not a living reality for him. I mean, it, it was, it was sort of a theoretical reality, but it wasn't something which, which, which you live a daily life with, and it became so rarefied and so idealized that you, th I, I can't. Okay, I'll, I'll give you, I mean, I remember once when I was, a, I was a congregational rabbi many, many million years ago, and uh, I remember there was a guy who came into Shalom Shabbos morning, and they wanted to give him glila. They wanted him to tie up the Torah, and he wouldn't do it. He said, well, sure, we'll show you how to do it. In fact, you know, that's when I already had scotch, and you didn't have to tie anything. It's not, it wasn't a big deal. No, he says, I'm not worthy, he said, to touch the Torah. Mm -hmm. now, that's a, now, that, that, now, that's a phenomenon. That's a phenomenon of, of the sacred. Anthropologists call this the phenomenon of the sacred as, as a source of danger, because if you're not worthy, then, then, then you may die. Not unlike the story uh, of the, uh, bringing the ark by David up to um, Jerusalem, you know, you do it the wrong way, you pay a very serious price. So I think that the fact that it was, it became so attenuated, our relationship became so weakened, so as a result, we sort of, we, may, we, we, we attributed so much sanctity and we're so concerned with, the, with making a mistake that we actually, I, I hate to say it this way, we almost diabolized it. We said, oh, you can't touch, you can't go near. Once we become close and realize you can come close to Kedusha and you can come over, you can, you can, you can walk right up to the wall but not any further, then, then it, it changes its entire, uh, its entire, uh, its entire um, essence into the way you identify with it. And I'm sure that that was part of the process. At what point, excuse me, historically did, you know, we sort of have a, live under a self-imposed mythology that the Western Wall is, is something very holy and sacred, and, and that's, you know, since the destruction, you just have obviously disproved that, but since the destruction, that's as close as we get. At what point did that mythology become... Prevalent. Look, there are indications that people prayed at different places. There are, um, there are indications, for example, that originally Jews prayed at the Eastern Wall, which, by the way, makes, the most, makes more sense. 
because, uh, because the, according to uh, some legends, the Mashiach will come through and uh, break through Shah Harachamim, the gates of mercy, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and whatever. So the reason why the Arabs, so it's an interesting, interesting point, the Arabs closed that gate to prevent the Mashiach from coming. In fact, there is one, I, I haven't really, I haven't run this down, but there are, uh, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine told me that the reason why there's a Muslim cemetery there is because they thought that the, the that somebody thought that the uh, Messiah will be a Kohen. And a Messiah, and the Messiah won't be able to uh, walk through the walk through the cemetery. I, I mean, I, I'll give them credit. I assume it's because he, he got confused between Elijah, who is a Kohen, and the Messiah, who's not. But the point is that that was a place of prayer. And then this thing sort of moved over, and eventually they came to the uh, they came to the Kotel. But just as a sign, by the way, of the attenuation of how people didn't understand. They, they were so, felt so alienated because they either because the Muslims wouldn't let them on the mountain or whatever the case might be. Things became so attenuated that there was a confusion as to what the Kotel was. You've got this funny situation, this, you've got this funny uh, belief that you're not allowed to touch the Kotel, you're not allowed to walk close to the Kotel. Why? Because the Kotel is the Kotel of the, of the wall of the, of the Beit HaMikdash. How do you know? Because, how do you know? Because there's a, uh, the Medrash says, that the Shechina is, is hovering behind the wall. This is the, this, is the, uh, this is the Western Wall. But the reference in the Medrash is to, the Midrash is to, is to the Western Wall of the, of the building, of the Hechal, which apparently was not, was not initially destroyed before the Christians first built a basilica on its site, and then the Arabs built the, uh, the, uh, the Dome of the Rock. Um, when some, apparently somebody went to, to Jerusalem, at, wrote home and says, what is the status of the Kotel Ma'aravi? Nobody knew the difference. They said, oh, this, is, must, this must be. They got the two Kotel Ma'aravis mixed up. And to this day, there are people who claim that it's the Kotel of the, of the Beit HaMikdash and they won't go near the Kotel as a result. But that shows you to what degree the, the lack, of familiar, lack of familiarity also influenced the uh, influence behavior. I'll add one other thing. This whole business with the Kotel is another example of, um, of this sort of conflicted, um, dishonest, I, it's, it's dishonest, you can't help it. It's a dishonest attitude of the Muslim authorities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, vis -vis the Kotel or the Har Habayit. On the one hand, Bait al Makdus, as I said, the Arabs, the Muslim, early Muslim sources all say that the Beit HaMikdash was built on Har Habayit. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, you have the situation which today uh, was just in the papers. The Palestinians are saying that the that the that the Kotel and the entire area in front of it has to belong to the uh, has to belong to the um, uh, to the Palestinian Authority. Why? Because according because the Mufti Yimach Shemo V'Zichro Hajim Hussaini, in order to be able to make a stake and get the Jews away from the Kotel, had a dream in which he said that that, that he saw that uh, that Muhammad came with his with his uh, horse Al Burak and he and he tethered the horse in front of the Kotel before he before he went up to heaven according to the Quran. And uh, to this day, if you look at the pictures of the liberation of the Kotel, you see that there's a big street sign on the Kotel that says Al Burak Square, named after the horse. What's the point? The point is, oh, now this is a Muslim holy place. It was never a Jewish holy place. So the whole, the whole thing doesn't. The, I mean, the, so you have on the one hand, I know that I know that I'm wrong. On the other hand, I'm going to assert supersessionism. The two go to uh, the two go together, and it requires, and, and because of that. Um, this is a, so. It, so our need to be able to go in Harabayit and to have and to have a Jewish presence in Harabayit is it is 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 is, is, is this, it's it's a multiple leveled need. It's a it's an internal need on our part to restore our connections with the place which is kadosh, because the Kotel is not kadosh. It's a mikudash. It has been sanctified. Mm -hmm. It is not inherently kadosh. That's number one. Number two, as opposed to asserting, asserting historical truth that this is our place. Number three, and this is the irony, um, we have because the, because the Navi says ki beti beti pilai yikare lechol hamim that uh, all of uh, that are my house will be a home for all for all peoples. We have an opportunity here to be able to make a demonstration of what what tolerance and uh, and living together can be. Because there's no reason why there couldn't be a place for Jewish prayer in Harabayat, at the same time as the Muslims would pray on Al Aqsa. And and the vision of uh, coexistence that uh, everybody still uh, everybody so much hopes for could actually be realized specifically by increased Jewish presence and by regular Jewish prayer on the Sand Temple Mount. As we like to say, Beiti, my house. The emphasis on my house, God's house, will be a house of prayer for all nations. Uh, Professor Wolf, 
Thank you so very, very much My for pleasure. this very, very informative uh, discussion and presentation of an actual continual Jewish presence, physical and spiritual, of course, to and connection to the Temple Mount since the destruction of the Holy Temple to our day. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our fascination with the Temple Mount is nothing new. No. Jewish always people have there. always been completely focused from the, from the time that the Temple was destroyed. We've never forgotten the central role that the Holy Temple plays. The understanding idea that there was a disconnect for 2,000 years is a total myth. Unfortunately, I think it's a, it's a self-perpetuating myth that uh, we now have to overcome in order to, to move forward. But everything about the work of the Temple Institute is about overcoming that self-perpetuating myth and just breaking out of that, of that um, mindset and reminding our people, of course that begins with the young generation, reminding us of the, of the call throughout the ages of the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. And towards that end, the Temple Institute has really created a genre. And that genre is the concept of the purity, the innocence, and the commitment of the children of Israel, the little children of Israel. Uh, two years ago, we debuted our classic, The Children Are Ready, which has been seen by nearly half a million people. Last year, we continued with the theme of The Children Are Ready, with The Children Are Ready too. Sequel. Sequel, which was a very bold statement of the young generation of our children confronting the tired mindset of their parents on that most difficult of all days, the ninth day of Av, the day upon which we commemorate the destruction of the temple, our children coming into the synagogue, looking at what's going on. Don't give it away, Rabbi. No spoilers here. No spoilers. Let's watch. The children are ready too. <laughs> 